point in this message tonight in his image. And you might say, why do you title this image like that when you're talking about some many things about this man that you're talking about? Well, first off, let's look at it in this respect. All the writings in the New Testament, as we see by Paul and those, they all taught how that we are a new creature in Jesus Christ. We are the beginning, really, of a new family. Jesus Christ is the beginning of that redeemed family. And the end result is we must, in this redemptive stage or state, we must, in the end result, be begin to reflect the image and likeness of Jesus. It's just not saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Baptist. I'm a Christian, but I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Christian, but this and that. When actually basic teachings of the Bible, some of them we've thrown in the ditch. So, we don't deny the fact that God's grace hasn't been good to multitudes of people, but the finished results is what we've got to look at. Do we together collectively, do we really bear the image and likeness of Jesus? Can we really be like Jesus, who just wanted to do the perfect will of God in so much that he could say, it's not I that doeth these things, it's not, it's not I that, this is not my word, it's his that sent me. And if we're going to be in the image and likeness of Christ, we must be a people that definitely are sold out to God to such an extent that it is literally truth that's allowed to live and reflect from us. Now then, and that's why there had to be a messenger, not a denominational evangelist, as Billy Graham or Billy Sunday Dwight L. Moody and all of those back in their era of time. That time had its day. But it's in the end time that God was to do something specifically to turn us around and get us back to truly the apostolic faith. Now, <clears throat> at this time in the message, I want to explain a little something other here in respect to the chart. When we're talking about 19 and 63, we're talking about an era of time that God to the man, the messenger to this age of Laodicea and to the hour, God dealt with him in bringing forth the revelation of the seals, as we read about in Revelations chapter 5 and 6. We know, brothers and sisters, we are no longer living in 1963. We are somewhere, brothers and sisters, on up the line. We're at least 30 years beyond that. Now, the scene here we, where we see Jesus standing with one foot on the land and one on the sea and Revelations chapter 10, and he cried as when a lion roared. We see here that Revelations 8 verses 1. That's really when the seventh seal is broken and opened in heaven, but it is followed then immediately by the sounding of seven thunders. This is Jesus on earth in spirit form or angelic form. Now then, let's look at something tonight <clears throat> as we deal with this. It's very apparent in the message and the followers of Brother Branham, all because in Revelations, the word angel many times is speaking of the angel messenger to the particular age. But when we do come to the age then of Laodicea, we then see that something has happened. And it was true in the life of Brother Branham. Many times he referred that the angel of the Lord is not over just 10, 15, 20 feet away. All of this has caused people to get their minds fixed on something other. But brothers, and by the grace of God, I want to unfix some who have absolutely went beyond the bounds of God's Word, and they're out here in a realm of fantasism. Fantasy. Fantasy is being hung up on a little thought. It sounds good. It has an invigorating effect to the inner senses of the person. But brothers and sisters, it is not a fantasy that has any revelatory quality to it at all. And it's a sad thing to say. There are doctors of divinity in this movement today by the things they perpetuate and presume that is the way it is. They only make themselves 
look very foolish in the eyes of God and the eyes of the Bible. Now, I'm going to go into it like this. Throughout the recent years since Brother Branham's been taken over the scene, all because of his experience out in Arizona, both in 19 and 63, and how he had this unusual visitation by these angelic beings. People presume them that we take that experience, how that portrays itself, and we try to interpret and set in motion ideas and plans for the future. I've said this many times. God himself, the creator of all mankind and the creator of the universe, has a right to deal in every man's life the way he chooses. Even Paul speaks of it in 2 Corinthians. How did he knew a man 14 years ago, whether in the flesh or out of the flesh, he would not say. But how he was caught up into the third heavens. Now the third heaven, brothers and sisters, let me say this. That has to put you in a realm of the Spirit of God and the glory of God. There's no doubt not many human beings could experience such a scene and probably be able to keep his senses together once he come back on earth in his right frame of mind. And he heard things uttered or spoken that he said was not good to be uh, uh, spoken or uttered about. Now, he's not telling you it was bad. He's just said something out of the extraordinary so far beyond comprehending the senses of human minds in reasoning that to even try to describe it you get all hung up so you don't find Paul even talking about it now the man that compiled this big book I'm going to read from his own words And I'm not reading this to condemn the man. But as he has pulled from all the messages through the years, every quote that Brother Bam stated about what the Lord had showed him in the vision, the third pull and everything, here he puts it together like this. He's referring in verse 11 of Revelations 10. The angel which is Christ, verse 1 and verse 5, tells this New Testament prophet that he is to prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Again, we must distinguish a difference between John and the New Testament prophet. And here's the part, brothers and sisters. If you don't have a spiritual mind to know how men can play with issues. Doctors of divinity have got a way of plastering you over and sealing you down, and you don't see a thing. Only just what they tell you. Now then, it's like this. We must distinguish a difference between John, who is on the Isle of Patmos in 96 A.D., and the New Testament prophet, Brother Branham. Brother Branham did say that John ate the little book. Now keep in mind, where in time was John at when he ate the book? That's the point, number one. You've got to go back to the fourth chapter. When he has written everything that is relative to the seven churches, then the fourth chapter, he heard the same voice that spoke to him from the beginning, said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that shall be hereafter or after this. Therefore, be taken up then. 
First off, that set a type of the rapture as the grace age comes to the close and the seventh age is closed down. But number two, this shows that as John is taken up, he is projected into the future tense of time. He no longer is going to see pictures or visions and hear words that are relative to what was going on then in the church ages. It's strictly going to be in the future tense. When this whole letter of prophecy, the letter of Revelation, is going to begin to be opened and made known to the bride of Christ. So then John is projected somewhere into the, we will say, the 20th century. When this understanding about this whole thing is going to begin to come forth. So then now this brother has put it in like this. But the compound revelation is that John is not the New Testament prophet. John did not ever give any prophecies that are recorded in Scripture. He is simply a scribe here in the book of Revelation, commanded to write only what he has seen. Revelations 1.19 The only New Testament eager prophet who ever prophesied before many peoples, nations, and kings was William Branham. Now, I know when I say this, my old critics of the message will jump on me and say, there he goes again. And brothers, let me tell you something. 1963, this is 1993. Now they've had 30 years to chew on me. And they ain't a one of them put together enough of sense that makes this man look like he brought something that is pure and true. For a, an educated man to say that John, because they can't read in his epistles, which is 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, that he ever wrote prophecy, that what John then saw in 96 A.D. really was not him. It was none other than William Marion Branham being projected to him in 96 A.D., but projected into the future tense. So then John, it would appear, is talking to a man that's not even yet been born. Brothers and sisters, God has always used men of the past to bring them before someone that lives beyond that man's hour. But let me say this. He's never reached out there and got something other that has not yet been born and brought it somewhere here, brothers and sisters, in that sense. Now then, I will have to say, I'll have to challenge any man to look at me long enough. There's four places in the total book of Revelation. The first chapter, if you look at it carefully, let's go to it. The first three chapters, John is aware he's still on the island. He's being dealt with while on the island. And as he records the introduction, it goes like this. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God, the eternal spirit, gave unto him, which is John, to show unto his servants those that John knew then in those seven churches that he's to write to, as well as servants of God that will be thereafter. 
things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent, the Lord sent, and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now the word angel in that sense is not talking about a messenger to any particular angel. Because brothers and sisters, it's in black letters. If we can get the thought right, we will better understand than when this scene does take place on earth one of these days to the bride of Jesus Christ. That's a picture the best we can portray it as it's written. But it is a picture that's not yet been fulfilled. It's Revelations 10. We must all realize, where is Jesus, the man, who died, that rose from the dead, that was taken up into heaven and seated on the right hand of power. Where is he at in this? He's still on the throne. He has never left that throne. That's a position of intercessory work that he as high priest must fulfill throughout the dispensation of grace. But it is God, the eternal spirit, who definitely will anoint an angelic being and send him forth to portray, to convey a thought, a picture of things relative. If it is something that God wants you and me to learn about the person of Jesus, who he is and what he is, that angel is anointed then to convey that and it don't take Jesus off of the throne at all. Because the Spirit of God is eternal. It's everywhere. But that angelic being can only be in one place at one time. So this is an angelic being being sent forth by God to start this great revelation. It is true. No other apostle was ever dealt with like this. And I'll have to challenge the statement in the man's book. When you say John never wrote prophecy and belittles his office because he's an apostle, I'll have to say, shame on a man. I don't care how educated he is. I'll stand you beside Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, and now tell me he never wrote prophecy. Otherwise, why would Paul write it like this? Know therefore that in the last days peerless times shall come. Will you agree with me that's prophecy? When he says in Thessalonians, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying ones, is that prophecy? Sure it is. Who is the man that tells us about the resurrection? It's Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. Then he goes to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and speaks some more about it. These things don't cut ice with me. And that's why I say, brothers and sisters, 30 years they have ran the road. And now, brothers and sisters, and some preachers have sat on the fence because they're scared to identify themselves really where they're at. I got a little song I'm going to read to you tonight that really tells the story like it is. The preacher on the fence. we got a lot of preachers in this religious world. They sit on the fence. They know what truth is, but they don't like to lose their friends. They don't like to be ridiculed. They don't like to be persecuted. They don't like to be identified with those that have to take the knocks and the bangs to get a job done that ever amounts to anything. Now this angel, as he starts, John is seeing a vision. That's what it is. But he sees this figure. And I don't want nobody to tell me, but Brother Jackson, God don't use angels like that. Read your Bible. The Apostle Paul says in, first, um, in the first chapter of Hebrews, how that God in sundry times and divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets. 
hath in these last days spoken unto us by his dear Son. And then he glorifies the Son. Then when he goes to the second chapter, then Paul lays down the, the stipulations. How shall we escape, therefore, if we neglect so great salvation, which was first spoken to us by the, the Lord and them later, them that sent him? Watch. Because if the word of angels, word of angels, was steadfast and sure. Why did Paul say that? Because that's what the word was that came by the prophets in the Old Testament. It's a ministering spirit of the angelic family sent forth by God to minister to that vessel of clay, the prophet. So it's really not the prophet's idea at all. It's God's word conveyed by that means. And these doctors of any who want to play with these little issues of angels, shame on you. If you talk as much about the Lord Jesus Christ as you talked about the messenger to the age, which is apparent they know very little about, take your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was none other brothers and sisters, then the incarnate God himself from heaven. Look at angels in the picture. When he went to the river and was baptized and God the eternal spirit condescended and came down and lived in that vessel of clay in the fullness of all of the divine qualities of God. Then that spirit that now has taken up its abode in the sun drives him into the desert. Because the Son is going to be tested in this. All you have to do is read your Bible. God the Father is never tempted. He can't be tempted. And neither does He tempt anybody. But we all will be tempted and tested and tried as our Savior. When we see how that Jesus then at the end of the fast, He hungered. Three times the devil came to him, manifested himself. You know the ordeal. When Jesus in the final test finally rebukes him and proves to him beyond the shadow of a doubt, he the Son of God who has God dwelling in him in all the fullness. Yet he did not yield to the devil's trick, but he walked away from the ordeal and has said, an angel came down and ministered to him. What for? I have to say to these doctors of divinity, where in the world have you been at all these years? That's a spirit being. Go back to Hebrews, what Paul said. Who made his angels ministering spirits. Servants, really, they are. Servants within the redemptive category. They're messengers. They're conveyors of something or another from God the eternal spirit. That's not the only time. We turn to the Gospels of St. John and we see Jesus coming forth now. He's coming back through the countryside. He's beginning to pick his disciples. There's a man sitting under a fig tree by the name of Nathaniel. Andrew and another one went and got him says, come and see a man who we believe is the Christ. Well, old Nathaniel, loud mouth as he was like a lot of these people today. Where'd he come from? And they said, Nazareth. And his reply was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And they said, well, come and see. So here goes that old Nathaniel, just like a lot of these Gentiles today, full of criticism, bickering, fussing, you couldn't convince him on anything. And here he goes with these two fellows. He thought they were nuts. But as he got close to this man, Jesus looks at him and says, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. Something about the way that Jesus said it hit him between the eyes. 
He just willed it and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' reply was to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, don't marvel at that. Did that surprise you? After this, you'll see the angels of heaven descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. What for? He's got God in him. Why does he need angels around in the group? I know I'm loud, brothers and sisters, but for 30 long years, some of these characters, they've ran the road, thrown out all of their junk. It's brought nothing but confusion the world over. And I have to say tonight, they're not going to have another 30 years to play around. God's going to, I hope he shakes their waterbed. I hope he knocks a hole to it. And they wake up some morning with a backache that they can't sleep right. Such erroneous. Some people can look at something or another, what's going on, and never could go away and tell it just like it was really happened. But that's not the only time that angels ministered. We find this. When the hour approached, Jesus was to face the cross. Now he must die as a man. And in that hour of agony, he faces it like a man. Because the eternal spirit which dwells in him in all its fullness is not going to show or manifest those divine qualities in preserving, or we will say refraining, the human being that he is from having to go through such an ordeal. Paul writes of it in Hebrews, and we see it in the Gospels. When that hour came, here he goes, he takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he sets them close to the gate and says, Now you stay there and watch and pray. And he goes a stone's throw, and he knelt and began to pray. You know this story. At first, Father, if it be thy will, grant this cup to pass from me. He was, it goes to show he was very much emotionally nervous, afraid. Because Paul said, who in the days of his flesh, with tears, he sought the will of God that he might escape this ordeal. And it was through that he learned to become obedient to the things he suffered. And finally in the last go-round, he comes back, brothers and sisters, as he slumps to his knees. Here in his mental capacity, he has now done accepted the fact it's written, he cannot escape it and be to mankind what he's supposed to be. It's his way of saying, Father, for this hour came I into the world. Oh, and brothers and sisters, he was sweating blood. What a physical torture he was going through. That's not God the Father suffering. That's the Son suffering. And brothers and sisters, when the Father sees now he has accepted death, he has accepted the finished work of redemption, he's willing to pay the price because in Hebrews, that for the joy that was set before him, he could look beyond the cross. He could look beyond the grave. He could look beyond that, and he could see what he was going to be elevated to, but he could also see what he was going to be me, a means to help elevate others up on the same level. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame. There came an hour he shook his head. Let it come. Read what the Bible says. A doctor of divinity came and give him a drink of water. No, an angel came and touched him. For what? The Son of God needed to be ministered unto. And I have to say tonight, there's some men in this message that need to be ministered unto more than just a man. So Jesus was led like a thief, like a robber, like a transgressor. Anything 
but a decent human being. He was led to Calvary, made fun of, mocked, scoffed, spit at, hung him on a tree, challenged him. If you're who you say you are, do this. Who you say you are, do that. He hung their brothers and sisters between heaven and, and earth. He died like a man. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, three days later, the Bible says, not man, the Bible says, when the time came for the Scriptures to be fulfilled, an angel came down. Why we got an angel in this? This is not an earthly man. This is an angel. Ministering spirit. And an earthquake came. And the stone was rolled away. And Jesus came forth when Mary Magdalene and them were the first ones to come to the tomb. They already saw the stone rolled away. They thought, oh my goodness, they've done came and stole our Lord away. Now where have they put him? But as they look inside the tomb, they saw two angels sitting in the tomb. What they doing there? God don't need your help. He's got angelic beings who are ministering spirits. And they work in his program precisely, exactly. Now then, let's get back to the book of Revelations. It's the only book constructed like this. Brother Branham was truly a messenger to the age of Laodicea. But don't never forget, behind that message, there has to be an angelic being of the spiritual family of God's angels that definitely is going to be that particular angel that ministers to him and through him to make his life fulfill what it is. In the book of Revelation, we take in the 19th chapter where John sees the bride in heaven. And I pray that one day we'll all be, be there. It's the same angel that's spoken of here. Now that he's in heaven, he sees this wonderful scene of the bride. He evidently saw something that would be that so thrilled him and excited him. Read it. He fell on his face to worship that angel. And that angel said, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets. Right there is where they say, Oh, see there, that was an angel messenger, William Branham, to the age. It's an angelic being. Then when you get over brothers and sisters to the 22nd chapter, and you see him going to do it again. Same words. Then when you come to the last verses of the chapter, then the angel speaks in the first person because it's red letters. All through the book of Revelation, that angel, which is described, he describes himself Yet when there was something about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, such as said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, it's not the angel who's the Alpha, but the angel is speaking for the first person. And that's the way the, the Lord Jesus would speak through. And we'll have to say this. That angel was so anointed to display characteristics and things about the person of Christ, and all of that was done to draw attention to the Lord Jesus Christ who took our place at Calvary. Now then, let's go back and examine this. I'd have to say this to the best educated doctor of divinity. <clears throat> Here's a glass. Let's just say that's an angelic being. I'm using it as a symbol. I don't think that God creates angels just to use them one time in his plan and like, now you go tell this person such and such and when you went and told them that, then you come back and sit down. 
I'll never use you again. I don't think we are to think that angels was created for such a display. If they're fellow servants, it means they're ministering spirits in a higher capacity to minister in the realm and relationship of them that shall be heirs of salvation. That's the way Paul explains it in Hebrews. All right. Now if I can have everybody's attention. All of you know that Elijah of old came on the scene when the nation of Israel was stooped, falling away in great apostasy. Right? There was something about this man. He catered to the wilderness. You see him there more than you do in the big city. Don't you? When God anointed then Elijah, will you agree with me that somewhere there has to be an angelic being in the scene, behind the scene, behind the curtain? That really is the one that's imparting to Elijah these various things. You've got to believe it. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have said in Hebrews, Now, if the word of angels was steadfast and sure, then don't tell me Elijah is the only one that never had an angel ministering to him. If God does anything, he's got his servants. And therefore, there are certain individuals in the human realm. He is going to to designate his plan through and to. So I see an angel anointed. This angel, we would say, is going to be an angel that's going to be dispatched to Elijah. This angel is going to follow him and at various times in the plan of God is going to anoint him and speak through him and cause him to motivate and react according to the will of God. It's really not Elijah's ideas in the first place. It's, it's God's ideas. It's coming through the channel of an angel. Don't kick him out of the picture, brothers and sisters. If you do, you're doing wrong. Then we will say this. That angel knows exactly what God the eternal spirit has anointed and authorized him to do, then that angel knows exactly how to communicate to work through that earthly recipient. Now God can take the man, but the anointing that was on the man and expressed through the man, God keeps it to himself. Now, if it's prophesied in the Bible, Malachi, that he would send that spirit of Elijah again. I noticed this also. I caught it searching through the message yesterday. The one who edited the church age book says that John the Baptist was the Malachi 3.1 but that he was not the Malachi 4. I have to challenge it. I hope you've read your Bibles. St. Luke's Gospel, first chapter, when the angel came to Zacharias in the temple, when he went in to burn incense, as the custom was, and the angel Gabriel spoke to Zacharias, and said his wife Elizabeth would conceive and have a son. The angel told him what his name would be. Now listen carefully to prove that he missed it when he said that John the Baptist was not the Malachi, was not the Elijah prophet of Malachi 4. He sure was, because if you read there on when the angel says, and he shall, be, he shall go before the Lord in the power and the spirit of Elias. 
to turn the heart of the father to the children and he cut it off. That angel did not even quote Malachi 3.1. It was Jesus who used Malachi 3.1 to vindicate who John the Baptist was. I'm not mad. I just know what I'm talking about. Since my name is known from here to yon, from the North Pole to the South Pole to the Equator, so I'm just going to give them something to think about. Thirty years later, brothers and sisters, they've had the road, and they've treated, created this confusion. No wonder the denomination of doctors of divinity jump on the Branham name, try to chew it and spit it out. Not a one of them characters have I ever seen dare to open their mouth, put something in print as a rebuttal to what the religious world says. After 30 long years, looks like they ought to say something in defense of the man they want to preach. So now then, do you know why that some people like in any and other places believe in this thing, reincarnation? You've got to realize that in the spirit world, there's spirits out there that's been around here, brothers and sisters, ever since they was a galaxy put in space. And if you listen carefully to me, you see exactly why it's like this. There is no such thing as reincarnation of the human spirit back 300 years later or 1,000 years later. But I'll tell you one thing. You let a devil get on someone somewhere back in the ages past. And that devil, an angel fallen, was allowed to exercise, demonstrate certain things through that individual. That that individual became a known person, like a witch. Oh yes, witches hit it right on the nose once in a while. It's, it's done that way to get attention. But when God gets tired of that human doing that, he just lets the human die. But that devil that talks through that human, he don't die. No. He stalks around on the face of this earth in the spirit realm waiting for another one. And he, he no doubt just keeps begging, please let me, I want, I want that one. And that's why you have individuals come on the scene. I lived 300 years ago. No, you didn't. That same old devil that's in you was alive 300 years ago. That's the way you've got to look at it. It's that same devil. Sure, he knows what the predecessor was. He knows what you're going to be. You're going to talk just like that one 300 years ago. Now then, Brother Jackson, how do you line these things? Because many times, brothers and sisters, these individuals who claim to be the reincarnation of an ant or somebody, say, that lived two centuries or two generations back, they'll come right along, and that spirit will show them exactly something other that pertained to ant or this or that. Now then, let me pick it and bring it back to this. I can see Elijah of old. When God took him across the river and took him up in a fiery chariot, God took the man. But I have to say, whatever, whoever that angel was, that walked with Elijah, that guided Elijah, that anointed Elijah, he's still in God's work category. And I'd like to think that when the hour came, that the angel Gabriel came to Zacharias and told him, his wife Elizabeth that had been barren will have a son, and thou shalt call his name John, because he shall go before the Lord in the power and the spirit of Elias to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. So he was part of Malachi 4. And I like, I like to think, since Elijah Bull liked the wilderness, John the Baptist spent much time. I like to think the same angel came right along to escort John through all of his earthly ordeal. And if it was prophesied that same anointing would come again, at the ending of this age of grace to turn the heart of the children back to the fathers, I like to think that it's the same angel that was with Elijah of old 
That was with John. Now it's with this man. Because that angel knows what he's doing. He's fulfilling certain pictorial things that must be characterized to the man's nature. I tell you, these people who want to say, oh, but the word of the Lord, it, it can never fail. I wrote a man a letter. I said, a bunch of men in this end time, they forced the hand of God to do something, and God's going to do it. First Kings, <clears throat> when Elijah was contesting all them prophets, and finally God answers by far. And Elijah of old, bold, and had 450 heads cut off. My, think of it. If he wouldn't run from 450 men who had muscles, who could have defended themselves if they wanted to. But I tell you, down there in that little old city of Jezreel, there was a woman by the name of Jezebel. When she heard that news, she said, you tell that old man about this time tomorrow, I'm going to have his head also. Now, Elijah did not know from that moment on what to do. Why are you saying that, Brother Jackson? To plainly give you the facts of the matter. James the Apostle said it like this. How that Elijah of old was a man subject to like passions, human weakness, feelings that affect the person as to how he sees things and looks at things. Elijah, he didn't know from that moment on what to do. Does it belittle Elijah to tell how he ran and had to be fed by an angel twice? Is this belittling Elijah of old? No, it's telling, it's telling the plain facts. And there he is in the cave down there in Horeb. Now you just read it. Listen to it. That's the trouble. Too many, they just read, they read that, but they don't really read it. I didn't even realize here Sunday night when I said about this. But yesterday as I was reading this, when the Lord then did speak to Elijah, what you doing here? Then Elijah made the excuses like he did. Then the Lord tells Elijah this. Now you leave. Come on back. Watch. And he said, Elijah, you return by the way of the wilderness to Damascus. That specific. And anoint Hazel to be king in Syria. Then you anoint Jehu to be king in Israel. And the last, you anoint Elisha to be prophet in your room. As I, I did say this Sunday night. Elijah had had already too much problems with that bunch of politicians. And the human he was, he's asking me a hard thing. And I'm having to say this. If God told him specifically where to go, I'd have to say the first thing he was really supposed to do, go anoint Hazel, then Jehu, then Elisha. But the human side, he knew where Elisha lived too. <laughs> How many believes he knew? He didn't run on to Elijah by accident. He didn't just stumble on him. No, he knew exactly where he lived. I'm sure if Elijah had not have been scared, we would have read the record different. He'd have come right out of that cave and he would have run right straight up through the wilderness. He knew where Damascus was at. He knew the trail to get there. But no, he didn't. He chose the easy way. He went right past and took his mantle and smote Elisha. Now you know the conversation that came about. The fact that he did that, brothers and sisters, is absolutely biblical proof. You're looking at a prophet, but you're also looking at the human side of the man. This don't disfigure him, please. It's a shame that people have to think like this. 
but we're Gentiles. We either got to be an idolater or an atheist. That's our two extremes. We're so full of unbelief, we either are an atheist toward recognizing what a prophet would be, or if we do see something that the Spirit of God moves, then we've got to worship it like it's a god. No Jew looks at his prophets like that. So the point is, when you really read the closings out of 1 Kings in the 2 Kings, Elijah never did anoint the, the other two, which was the foremost. It was Elisha, after he's in office. He's the one that anoints. And the man that is evident that Elijah was afraid of, which was Benadad, Elisha was asked to come and pray for him. You know the story. Now that's all I'm going to say in that respect. I have said that enough to try to show you, brothers and sisters, that Brother Branham was definitely a man anointed of God, and that anointing characterized in him much the same gift that was in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he would stand on a platform and look so far back, I knew it's impossible for the human eye to describe a dress, all the flower and figures in it. Or he could stand there and look at a person back there that's so far away, the Lord just has to lift it up and project the person out, and he'd say, Miss so and so. You're not from here. You're from such and such a state. I see the terrain where you come from. Your house number is such and such. Don't tell me, brothers and sisters, that isn't God. But it's the Holy Ghost. The same Holy Ghost that was in Jesus Christ. That was in the man. And I have to say, if there was angelic beings that ministered to the person of Jesus Christ... Then there's angelic beings that ministers in and through the person of William Branham. But it's God who is all in all. And all these people who wants to preach the man, I'm look, the man I'm looking for, brothers and sisters, please, to come and get me in the rapture has got nail scars in his hands. He's got a scar in his side. I go on record saying, I thank God for the man I saw. Because he made the Christ of this Bible stand out and projected him head and shoulders taller. Oh yes, I have saw the, the various ones who would like to be recognized as great men. But when God did deal with him in 1963 and he preached the seals, when that first seal, which was described as the white horse rider, and there he said, that's that Antichrist spirit that began to ride back there at the closing of the first age coming into the second age. Brothers and sisters, when you look back at Paul's writings, and Paul in Thessalonians says, even now the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There he's a riding. It's a deceiving spirit. It's a disguising spirit. It looks like Christ, but it's not. Paul described it also, false prophet false apostles. Even little John says, we know that there will be false prophets. So he did prophesy, didn't he? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I have to say, we are Gentiles. When he come to that second horse, that red horse, it's not something that's out there in the future. Showed how it rode during that second age, carried in, actually carried over into the third age in all of its evil. What an hour of martyrdom when in the Roman society Christians were slaughtered and butchered and carried away like animals. And then that black horse, look what he did. By the time we come into the fifth century, that black horse is riding all over Europe. Because it is absolutely the spirit of Antichrist. Because it has changed the word of God. It has turned the word of God into rituals and things and sold the gospel. And it brought death to Europe. 
No wonder it was called in secular history the Dark Ages. And then the gray horse, it's riding right in this hour. At a distance as the sun reflects on its coat, yes, it would look like a white horse. But you can see, brothers and sisters, here it's characterized in the religious world we have today. Old Roman Catholicism, the old black rider. But Protestantism and all of these ecumenical and everything else coming in, blended together. And brother, that gray horse is galloping tonight in the religious world, deceiving the masses of people. And when it comes to that fifth seal, we see them sold under the altar. And how they cried, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou not avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? We realize, brothers and sisters, in 1963, we was only about 18 or 19 years after the closing of World War II, we find that them souls was them Jews that had died, that had t were tortured, burned, gassed, buried alive, some of them, by Hitler said as white robes was given to them rest a little season brothers and sisters when those things begin to come together like that it lets you know brothers and sisters all of that's not yet in the future that has been done in the past that don't mean there's not evil things but whatever evil there is in the tribulation it's only reenactment of what he's already been doing in very other period of time only just in a we will say in a hundredfold way for a short period of time brothers and sisters it wasn't no time after brother Branham was dead Billy Graham come along with his book the four horsemen Pentecostals went after Jehovah Witnesses they published almost the same kind of a story they put it off in tribulation but I'm thankful brothers and sisters to know it was that fifth seal that really set everything in perspective. Because, brother, when you've actually lived through the era of World War II, and you know how the news carried from the, through the years of the war, or how Jews were slaughtered and butchered and died. And to think there their souls is, crying out, how long? And it was said, rest a little season. And a little season, we have to realize, has to fit in that framework of this human generation that Jesus talked about in Matthew 20. Now, <clears throat> I've got more yet to say, but I must bring it to a close tonight because I want to go into some other things that I feel like will bring out some more details about how we're to be looked upon and how our lives really is to characterize the true image and likeness of Christ. And so I'm going to close my testimony tonight and just say, I know to some who think through the years that they've said it like this. Jackson's not in the message because he don't preach the prophet. That's exactly what to say. I was even asked one time, Brother Jackson, why don't you preach the prophet? Because God didn't call me to preach the prophet. He called me to preach Jesus Christ. And if you go back and see what he said, he preaches Jesus Christ. He exalted Jesus Christ. How in the world can human beings be carried away by such? I call it stupidity. It is. It's a shame. Well, you can turn the video off. <laughs> because some of these days we'll get.